New York, 1987. The city is in the middle of a violent crime wave, income inequality in Manhattan is among the worst in the country, and a callous presidential administration is ignoring an epidemic that has killed tens of thousands of people. But inside the Imperial Elks Lodge on West 129th Street, a group of performers have gathered to get away from all that for just a few hours. I came, I saw, you know what I come. That's the boy. All aboard, and welcome to Matt Baum's Culture Cruise, where we take a deep dive on LGBTQ milestones in entertainment that changed the world. Last month, we looked at 1967's documentary The Queen, which captured a slice of New York drag culture right before Stonewall changed everything. Now, we're going to jump ahead 20 years to Paris is Burning, the groundbreaking documentary that captured another small hidden slice of New York drag culture right before everything changed again. And thanks to everyone who makes Culture Cruise possible with a pledge of support on Patreon. Folks like Garth Jensen, Gareth Marshall, and Fredo Alvarez. You can head over to patreon.com slash mattbaum to help keep these videos coming and check out some backer rewards. Before we talk about Paris is Burning and Voguing and the mummy in Dorian Corey's closet, which I promise we will get to, we'll need a quick refresher on New York's dragon ballroom scene. I went into a lot more detail on that history in last month's video about the Queen, but for now, what you need to know is New York's drag balls have their origin in annual galas that started in the latter half of the 1800s. Those balls grew, like balls do, into a golden age in the 1920s, a period known as the Pansy Craze. But although they allowed people of all races to compete, the balls weren't exactly welcoming to people of color. Black drag performers almost never won first place in the contests, and they were expected to lighten their skin to compete. Drag balls then faded from public view in the 1930s, thanks to a moral panic that forced queer culture underground. Thirty years passed, and then, with the sexual revolution in the 1960s, drag balls gradually came back out into the open, leading up to the pageant captured in the documentary The Queen. They didn't know it then, but when they shot The Queen, drag was about to change forever. At the very end of the pageant, we see a confrontation involving the reigning Miss Manhattan, Crystal Abasia. Crystal, where are you going? This is not the time to show temperament. Get back here and stay with the other finalists. Crystal unexpectedly walks off stage when it's announced that the judges placed her third. Not only was she passed over for the crown, but as Miss Manhattan, she'd had to deal with systemic racism that had been a part of the ballroom scene for a century. And on that night, in 1967, her frustration erupted. I have a right to show my color, darling. I am beautiful, and I know I'm beautiful. So whatever happened to Crystal? Well, now we're ready to talk about what happened after the Queen. Crystal and her friend Lottie started organizing their own drag pageants, and their own drag house, the House of Labasia. Where the pageant system had titles like Emperor and Empress, drag houses were structured more like families, support networks for queer people who might otherwise have been all alone. Each house had a mother, and Crystal is recognized as the first mother of the House of Labasia. Drag houses kept growing and were a big part of queer life in New York by the 1980s, particularly in communities of color. But most of America had no idea they existed, until the documentary Paris is Burning came out in 1990. The film was shot over a period of several years, and it doesn't tell a linear story so much as present a series of vignettes of Harlem's drag balls in the mid to late 80s. We're introduced to a handful of figures who would come to reign over the scene, like Pepper LaBeja, who became the house mother after Crystal. Crystal was the founder. I'm, I just rule it now with a soft glove. There's Dorian Corey, a seasoned veteran of the circuit. I always had hopes of being a big star. And Venus Extravaganza, who's young and idealistic. I want a car. I want to be with the man I love. I want a nice home away from New York. We meet people who come to the balls to dance, to show off, to feel a sense of strength. You go in there and you feel, you feel 100% right as a be being gay. And that's, and that's not it. what it's like in the world. It's not what it's like in the world. And it really wasn't. To understand why balls were so important, you need to understand the climate in the mid-1980s. For all the civil rights advances of the previous decades, it was still a pretty bleak time for queer people. Homosexuality is a sin. I don't care how you define it, it's not normal. It's uh, what Freud has called uh, perversion. Okay, what Freud actually said in 1935 was that homosexuality is, quote, nothing to be ashamed of, no vice, no degradation. It cannot be classified as an illness. But hey, since when have homophobes let facts spoil their homophobia? Life in the 1980s was particularly rough for queer people of color. This is white America. 
And when it comes to the minorities, especially black, we have had everything taken away from us, and yet we have all learned how to survive. Making matters worse, by the mid-1980s, homophobic legislators had started using the HIV epidemic as an excuse to demonize queer people, with proposals that even included forcing anyone with HIV into concentration camps. We know to a certainty that AIDS is transmitted in great measure by homosexual conduct. The bill which allows for criminal prosecution of doctors who fail to turn in the names of people who have AIDS or test positive for the virus. We want to identify every person who's a carrier. We want to identify every possible way to stop them from, from spreading the disease before it becomes a really serious national health threat. Different subcultures within the queer community develop different ways of dealing with the epidemic and with the homophobia of the time. The subjects of Paris is Burning describe the balls not just as an escape, but also a way to feel empowered. I like the competition. Makes me stronger. Makes me think more. Makes me want to come back and get them. You can see that feeling of strength and triumph when you watch people walking, especially when they get their trophies. They explain that for one night, no matter how rough things are in real life, they can still live out whatever their fantasy might be. You know, a lot of those kids that are in the balls, they don't have two of nothing. Some of them don't even eat. They'll go out and they'll steal something and get dressed up and come to a ball for that one night and live the fantasy. But the benefits of the balls weren't all fantasies. There was also an aspect that was very real, and that's the family. Since being founded by Crystal, the houses adopted a system of mothers who looked over each house and the children that they protected. Remember, the world was extremely hostile to queer people, particularly queer people of color. And it wasn't uncommon at the time for youth to get kicked out of the house and abandoned by their biological family when they came out. Here's how that was depicted in mainstream entertainment at the time. Dad, do you want me to leave too? I don't care what you do. So when are you coming back? When I'm welcome. If you feel that unhappy about it, just throw them out and tell them you never want to see them again. It is wild that the studio audience gives that line a laugh, but that gives you an idea of just how seriously people took LGBTQ youth homelessness at the time. And just one more thing to note about those clips, all of those examples are white families. That's because, with very few exceptions, the media's depiction of queer people was overwhelmingly white at the time. We'll talk a lot more about that racism in a few minutes. For now, just keep in mind how commonplace family rejection was, and how drag houses provided support that many biological families didn't. The House of Extravaganza has done a lot. It's made me feel like I have a family. But this is a new meaning of family. It's a question of a group of human beings in a mutual bond. Because they're real parents and give them such a hard way to go, they look up to me to fill that void. So that's another reason this world developed, why houses came to exist. In a world that was particularly hostile, ballroom was a place of power, celebration, support, fantasy, and family. So what were the balls like? Well, the format will probably be familiar if you've ever been to a drag show or a pageant or watched Drag Race. It starts with categories. Going to school. Town and country. The category is Butch Queen first time in drags at a, a ball. ball. You know what I mean. And just compare those categories with what we saw 20 years earlier in The Queen. There's basically one look in that 1967 pageant. Beauty Queen. First place went to whoever looked the most like a glamorous movie star, to the point that the winner in The Queen is literally named after movie star Jean Harlow. So they made the categories where everybody, they've all walked the runway in some category or another. But there's always something there for everyone. And that's what keeps them all coming. Dorian's describing a big shift between The Queen and Paris is Burning. Remember, the early drag galas were technically open to everyone, but they weren't really welcoming to people of color. So after Crystal helped start drag houses in the 1970s, the new balls were, by design, far more inclusive than what had come before. This was a world by and for people who had felt excluded. Not just from mainstream culture, but from queer subculture. And when Paris is Burning was released, mainstream audiences loved what they saw. The new award-winning film, which is being released nationally tomorrow, Paris is Burning, is getting major, major, major attention. It features, as I said to you, exotic gay subculture in New York that helps gay and lesbian young people to feel wanted and loved and accepted by dressing up as their fantasies. Remember, there was very little media representation of any queer life at this time, let alone drag, let alone queer drag performers of color. For many people, Paris is Burning was their first introduction to concepts that are much more familiar today. Stuff like reading and shade, for example. Shade comes from reading. 
reading came first. Then reading became a developed form where it became shade. Shade is, I don't tell you you're ugly, but I don't have to tell you because you know you're ugly. And that's shade. The documentary also defines voguing, kind of. This, ladies and gentlemen, is voguing, a form of dance that has its roots in Harlem, a takeoff on runway modeling. And I had never seen anything quite like it. And I'm Connie Collins, News 4, Manhattan. Okay, this newscaster isn't really equipped to define voguing, but Willie Ninja, a choreographer who got his start in ballroom, has a lot more insight. Voguing came from shade. Instead of fighting, you would dance it out on the dance floor, and whoever did the better moves was throwing the best shade, basically. So voguing is like a safe form of throwing shade. Right after that interview was shot, but before the documentary was released, voguing would become a huge international phenomenon. But it didn't come to mainstream audiences through the balls, at least not directly. Madonna discovered voguing through one of her dancers, Jose Extravaganza, a member of the House of Extravaganza. As the story goes, Madonna's hairdresser told her about the balls, and Madonna just showed up at a club one night and asked Jose to dance. She said, I heard you do this Vogue thing, and I, I want to see. She must have liked what she saw, because she began working with Jose and Luis Extravaganza to create the moves for the Vogue music video, as well as its various incarnations on tour and at the MTV Music Awards, which includes an early televised thwarp. Fun fact here, ballroom isn't the only queer culture that Madonna's lifting in this video. The cinematography is a pretty direct homage to the work of a gay fashion photographer who worked for Vogue magazine in the 1940s. He went by the name Horst P. Horst. He was still alive when this video came out, and he was apparently pretty annoyed that Madonna never asked his permission. And that brings us to a topic that has to be addressed when talking about Paris' burning, and that's cultural tourism and appropriation. So Paris' burning brought a big spotlight onto a culture that was previously invisible to the mainstream. But the person behind that spotlight, Jenny Livingston, wasn't fully a part of that culture herself. So although the director, Jenny Livingston, is queer and was friends with people in the ballroom scene and had been attending balls for years, she wasn't a performer or a member of a house. And in the years since Paris' Burning came out, it's drawn criticism for the fact that it was made by someone who wasn't an active participant in ballroom, but was instead an outsider looking in. In particular, the writer Bell Hooks points out that Livingston's film creates what Hooks calls an imperial gaze, where the subjects are defined by the observer rather than by themselves. And that definitely does happen in the film at some points. For example, when voguing is defined by a completely clueless white newscaster. A takeoff on runway modeling, and I had never seen anything quite like it. But to be fair, the primary definition does come from people of color, who are actual dancers. So voguing is like a safe form of throwing shade. In her essay, Is Paris Burning?, Bell Hooks also accuses the documentary of failing to challenge white privilege. Remember how important fantasy is to ballroom? Listen to how the documentary connects fantasy to race. That is everybody's dream and ambition as a minority, to live and look as well as a white person. If you have captured the great white way of living, you is a marvel. Paris is Burning presents the ultimate fantasy of ballroom as being glamorous and wealthy, which are represented as being exclusively white. Whether the subjects are looking at magazine covers or retail or characters on Dynasty or supermodels, there are no black role models. And one of the major critiques of Paris is Burning is that it doesn't challenge that white privilege and show more aspirational black figures. There certainly were black stars and supermodels at the time. Iman, Grace Jones, Naomi Campbell. But in fact, Dorian Corey talks about how black role models, like the actress Lena Horne, were just overlooked. When I grew up, of course, you know, black stars were stigmatized. Nobody wanted to look like Lena Horne. Everybody wanted to look like Marilyn Monroe. Now, I realize that I, too, am describing a culture that I am not a part of. In this video, I'm making choices about what clips to show you and how to explain the historical context, and I'm doing all that from a position of white privilege. Whenever you're learning about or discussing marginalized cultures, I think it's important to listen primarily to the people in those cultures. So by no means should I be your primary source on ballroom. 
I'm glad that you're watching now, but by all means, don't stop here. There are some amazing other videos that you should check out, made by black people in the ballroom scene. Start with BET's series Queer as Fuck, which released a documentary last year called Ballroom A Safe Space, featuring interviews with members of the House of LaBeija. You should also watch the TEDx talk by Ronald Murray where he breaks down the language of voguing, and check out ballroom throwbacks for hours and hours and hours of conversations with people of color in the ballroom community. And of course, read that Bell Hooks essay, Is Paris Burning? I have links to all those in the description for this video. And many of the subjects of the film were unhappy with it as well. Here's Octavia St. Laurent talking about it several years later. So how do you feel about Paris is Burning? <laughs> It's a terrible movie. I don't understand what people think is so great. Some of the subjects planned to sue for a share of the profits from the film and wound up accepting a distribution of a few thousand dollars, which was pretty unusual for a documentary at the time. The years that followed Paris' burning brought fame to some of the people in the doc, particularly Willie Ninja, who had big dreams. I want to be a big star. Uh, known generally every corner of the world. Following the film's release, he went on to dance with Janet Jackson and Malcolm McLaren. Willie passed away in 2006, but to this day, his house has members all over the world, just like he dreamed, and his children are icons in the scene. But the future wasn't so bright for other people in the documentary. In a 1993 follow-up, the New York Times tracked down some of the subjects and found that many had passed away. Dorian Corey left a particularly strange mystery behind. After she passed, her friends went through her belongings and found a mummified human body in her closet. A note attached to it said that it was someone who tried to break into the apartment and that Dorian shot him, and fingerprints suggested that the remains were a man who had disappeared 25 years earlier. But to this day, nobody's exactly sure how he came into Dorian's life, or how Dorian managed to mummify him. Other documentary subjects saw their health decline over the following years, in part due to a lack of effective treatment for HIV, and Venus Extravaganza, who dreamed of a better life, was found murdered. Her killer was never caught. Violent crime, drug use, and HIV was devastating the community. There was one study that showed that 62% of participants in house and ballroom were HIV positive. By 1993, reporters who covered the ballroom scene were starting to use the past tense to describe it. And for a time, it looked like there was a possibility that ballroom could literally die out. So why didn't it? Well, in part because in the 90s, the houses recognized what was happening, and they banded together to create a unified front to fight AIDS with a new collaborative house, the House of Latex, which threw the annual Latex Ball. That was a giant annual party to raise money and awareness, to provide education and distribute safe sex materials, and it continues to this day. And there was another initiative called Project Vogue that matched HIV educators to house mothers and fathers, teaching them safe sex practices that then they could pass along to their children. Those projects were watched very closely by HIV educators in the 90s and into the 2000s, and those researchers found that the family structure that the houses provided in the form of emotional support and a sense of pride and mentorship all correlated with better sexual health. In other words, the family structure created by Crystal decades earlier turned out to provide more than just escape and support. Crystal and the houses literally saved people's lives. Today, we're living in an incredible time for ballroom. We have shows like Pose, with a production team that includes queer and trans people of color, and Legendary, which highlights the amazing work of real-life houses. And crucially, we have real-life role models who are black and queer and a real part of the community. Back in the 1980s, Dorian Corey said that she used to dream of being a star, but as she got older, she found herself hoping for something else. Something that I think she ultimately achieved. Everybody wants to leave something behind them. And then you think, you left a mark on the world if you just get through it. And a few people remember your name. Then you left a mark. If you shoot an arrow and it goes real high, hooray for you. Thanks for cruising along with us, and thanks to everyone who makes Culture Cruise possible with a pledge of support on Patreon. If you're enjoying these videos, head over to patreon.com slash mattbaum to check out some backer rewards, like early access to Culture Cruise videos, books and stickers in the mail, and more. Now, if you'll excuse me, I gotta go shoot an arrow real high. <laughs>